Do you know that you can use a function as a row source in Microsoft Access for list boxes and combo boxes? I bet you don't. Hi, I'm Philip from CodeCabinet.com and today I'm going to dig up some very, very unknown feature of Microsoft Access, the row source function. The row source function is a very special function with a special signature and the, the signature are the arguments and the return type of the function. It is a special type of function that you can use as a row source for your list boxes and combo boxes. The best way to explain what I'm talking about is to show you a demo in code in Access. I prepared a little sample here and this is basically a blank form but there is some VBA code behind it. But before we look at the code, let's put a combo box here and let's look at the row source type. You know you usually can put a table or query in there, a value list or a field list. But there is more. You can also put in the name of a function in here and that will be the row source function. And before we look at that, let's put a list box here as well. And we also put in the function name here. Now let's quickly look at that. And you see this list box lists all the Mondays in the next couple of hundred days. And all the same for this combo box. But how does it work? Now let's look at the VBA code. Here is the list Mondays function. And this is nothing I came up with myself, but it's almost verbatim copied from the Microsoft website. And this URL, the text at that URL also explains how the function works. So you can go there and read the documentation. It's all completely supported and documented by Microsoft. It's no dark magic I'm showing today. The most important part is the signature of the function and that is its argument list and the argument types and the return value here. So any row source function you write has to have these arguments with the exact data types and the return value. But now let's look at the arguments one by one. This one field as control is just a reference to the combo box or list box control that invokes the function. And yes, that is pretty important. This function will be invoked from access automatically. By writing the function name to the list box, you tell access, call this function whenever you need to know anything about the data in that list box or combo box. So access will call the function and not you. You have to write the function and make sure that it is returning the correct values, but access will call this function. So we're going to skip the ID. I'm going to say a bit on that in a minute row and column that are numeric values, integer values that identify the row and the column for which the function is called. More on that in a second. And a very important parameter is the code. And if you look at the function, there is a select case code here and that expands basically down here and it totally drives what this function does. It totally depends on the code value that is passed into the function by access. Now let's look at the individual options one by one. First, there can be a value of ACLB initialize. That is, all these constants are 
constants that are built into access so you can use them right away. When the function is called with the initialize constant then that is the very first call to the function and the function is supposed to return true or false in this case. True if the function says yeah I can provide the data for this control or false if the function wants to say sorry I have no idea what you're talking about I cannot give you any more information. And then the control or the, the list of the combo box will stay blank if you return false but obviously we want to um, control the the data and the controls so we return true here. Now the next one is open here and that expects a timer value or no it expects a unique ID value and uh, Microsoft just supplied the timer value which is pretty much unique during the life cycle of the application and this value will go up into the ID here after this initial call with the ACLB open argument you will get the ID value in here the unique ID you supply to the function and it's supposed to be um, an identifier for the instance of the control that is calling the function. And I do not really understand why that is necessary because we said, yeah, we, we've got the control here and that is um, means to identify the calling control. So I don't really know why you would need that ID. It, maybe it is for speed because just Checking for one numeric ID value is lots uh, faster than, than identifying a control by name or by whatever other property. Well, but let's look at the next couple of properties and they are much more interesting to us. Now, the list box um, has a row count and that is what your function is supposed to return. It is supposed to tell the, the list box how many rows are in there. And the same goes for the column count. Then you're just supposed to tell um, the list box how many columns are in there. And now we've got just one here. Next is uh, the column width in here. Um, and if you supply a minus one, it says just use the default width. And the most important part is um, the get value thing. And now this is where the row and column arguments come into place. This sample function only has one column. So we pretty much ignore the column value, but we need to check for the row. And that is used here. This bit is just calculating the next Mondays in the future. But this is the row argument and that will tell the function for which Monday do we want to calculate the exact date. That is basically how it works. And in, in this line we assign the return value and that is what the list box displays in one particular row in one particular column. So this list box function is called lots and lots of times. For each value in any column and row in your list box this function is called. So you should make sure it usually responds pretty fast or otherwise your list box will display the values very very slowly. But more on that in a second. Well so far so good. We discovered a really really unknown feature in Microsoft Access. We now know how to use it. But so what? I have to admit, I used the Rosos function once, maybe twice in the last 20 years. And the one time I can remember for sure was to um, help build some very complex data import where I had to read a text file and pass the data line by line and process it 
to uh, kind of import it and I wanted to build a preview for that. And for this preview function I used a list box with a row source function to, to be able to do that complex processing. But even there it would have been possible to import the data into a temporary table and then just bind that uh, the list box to that temporary table. So even there we can work around not using the row source function. And originally I wanted to leave this here and end the video here. But while preparing the video I had an idea that I think is a real use case where it can be extremely helpful to have the row source function. Imagine you are querying remote data like data from a web service and that web service has a bit of latency and you are not exactly sure which data or how much data the user wants to see. And in this scenario the row source function can be very very helpful. But I think it's best I show you an example on screen. So here's another demo form and it is supposed to call some sort of forecasting services where, where the user can get a forecast value of whatever. It could be a weather forecast or some uh, stock value forecast or whatever forecast. And it's on the web, it's providing logic and it's giving us a value, but it's not calling to a real web service. I created a fake web service, a local class that is behaving very, very similar to a web service. It has latency on every simulated web call and it takes time to calculate each result. And I created that fake class so I don't depend on uh, any real service. That is also very, very helpful if you want to automatically test stuff. Then it's helpful if you can replace any web service and dependency on the net through a fake web service like this. Uh, but enough on that. Um, let's imagine the user would usually uh, need just 10 to 20 rows in, in the next 10 to 20 days, but he could also need more data like uh, the next 365 days and the web service can provide this 365 days. So normally what we would do if you know, yeah, the user might need 365 days of data, we would say, yeah, okay, um, we, we query 365 days and that's what's going to happen. The form freezes for some time. And you see the, the uh, hourglass is coming up. I'm going to cut this out. So you see now the service returned and I locked the total query time of 37 seconds. And now all the data, the 365 records have been retrieved. And now I can easily scroll through all the records here. So that, that is now it's pretty convenient. The user can just scroll to whatever date he's interested in. And it ends here in uh, 365 days in the future. But that initial wait was a pretty huge problem because the user had to wait for 37 seconds. That is not very user friendly. Now let's quickly close the form and reopen it. We query only 10 records here. And once again, we initialize the service and you see it has taken only one, one and a half seconds here. I, I just do a date diff so the seconds are rounded. It was pretty much one and a half seconds. And now the user immediately sees the 10 first rows after a second and a bit. That is pretty user friendly. And now if the user scrolls, you see there is a bit of latency, but now he can scroll. And if you might have noticed, the query time went up a second and we can now scroll. And once we get beyond the 20, there will be a short lag 
for another two seconds now but you see now the user can scroll and the user can also scroll right to the end of the list and you see we are at day 365 and the user had only to wait for seven seconds in total but he will feel um, much less time because he was interacting here and now if we scroll up you see there's a bit of latency once again but now the data was retrieved and the data is there and we can also move the scroll bar right to the middle and there is a bit of lag but only for a couple of seconds here and now the user sees the the data in the middle of the time range so this is much more user-friendly behavior and keep in mind the user would not have to enter anything here he would just see this and he just needs to scroll he does not need to fiddle with any values he does not need to think about how many rows of data do i need he just scrolls to where he needs the data and of course there is a bit of latency but then once the data is retrieved now here for the first records he can scroll immediately okay let's look at the design view and more importantly the code behind the form this is the row source function it has a different name now but arguments are the very same so we skip right to the important part here which is the get value stuff in here this list box has a header so the the row zero is just retrieving the header and then we will just go in here and return the header values the really important part to retrieve the data is basically this bit here where i use my web service and tell the web service i need this row of data here that is the row value passed into the function and it will query the data for that row and then after it received the data then that is just a string array then it will show the data or return the data for the column that was requested this bit here that is just i store the the last retrieved row here and then i compare the last queried row with the row that is requested right now just to find out if the user is scrolling downwards or upwards and then i tell the web service yeah query this row that is immediately requested and the 10 next rows that is what i entered before to to kind of get a little bit ahead of the user and not query each row individually and i enter 10 rows it would probably make more sense to query 20 or 30 rows but that totally depends on the web service and this scenario and and what the user most likely will want to see well this was a bit of an artificial sample created purely for this video I think that this is something that I will very, very likely use in a real world application because the scenario of querying data from web services comes up more and more. So this is very realistic and it is easy to use. Of course, you could build something similar using temporary tables and tracking the scroll bar to, to kind of get the same behavior but it is much more difficult to implement that than using the row source function. So I think that is a very good use case for that and it's good to, to have the row source function in mind just in case you need to do something like that. Have you got other ideas where we could use the row source function in a real world application? If yes, please let us know in the comments. So, and anyway, I hope you enjoyed digging up that uh, rarely used stuff that hardly anyone knows and you enjoyed the video. In any case, thank you very much for watching and bye bye.